surgery. I'm excited. I'm hearing all this. Mm. Perfect. Boom. And we are live. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to a very special edition of Off the Record on the People's Podcast this evening. We have an incredible guest with us, one who's going to give us some amazing information as well as inspiration, and that is none other than Brother Khalil Muhammad out of New York City. Uh, first of all, assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum, sir. Long time coming, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This means a lot to myself, my family, and the viewing audience of the People's Podcast, sir. Um, you... You watch me and my siblings grow up, and I'm and I'm. Hold on, one second. You watch me and my siblings grow up, and um, I'm very close with uh, you know your children when they watch them grow up and they were young when they were here. So to see you um, come on people's podcast, this means a lot. Uh, so many people are saying, "I saw Malaykum family, some like the Tracy, this is the Khadija." Thank everyone who continues to watch. Okay, yes, sir. So, brother Khalil, the first question that um, we want to know is, when did you first hear the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Well, let me, I'm gonna, let me go back for a second. I just want to open up in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. I bear with that there is no God but Allah, and I bear with that Muhammad is his messenger. And I also want to uh, let you know that I'm deeply honored to be on your podcast because this has become part of the culture right now. You know, you've interviewed, I mean, when I log on to some of your interviews, I'm just like amazed that you have uh, this captive, you've cornered a market on, on this podcast. Crazy. So I want to just, uh, you know, tip my hat to you, man, and, and tell you that I'm proud of what you're doing uh, and keep doing what you're doing, man. But uh, to answer your question, I first heard the teaching of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad <clears throat> in um, 1985 uh, through the 5% Nation. Um, you know, I grew up in the, in the island of Jamaica, uh, West Indies, and I came to the States, came back to the States because I was born here in Brooklyn, but I was raised uh, in Jamaica. Mm. So I came back to the States by way of San Diego, California. Uh, so my introduction to the teachings was when I came, when I left San Diego and came to New York in 1984, which was, uh, which was around the time of Power at Last and Forever at the Garden. Beautiful, praise be to Allah, yes sir. And why did you, what was it that made you accept the teachings? Well, what made me accept the teachings, uh, there's, a, there's a few events that took place before I actually accepted. Uh, I heard the teachings from 1984, but I didn't accept the teachings till around the time of 1990, going into 1991. Uh, and that's when I heard uh, Dr. Khaled. I heard Dr. Khaled speak here in New York at uh, the 369th Armory where uh, the minister kind of springboarded the all men's meeting uh, for the Million Man March. So I heard Dr. Collett speak there along with Ice Cube and Public Enemy, it was a concert. But when I heard Dr. Collett speak, you know, it was so profound to me, like I had never really seen, seen any Muslims that look like Khalid. And the command presence that they had when I saw them, it was just like, wow, look at, yo, look at these. They look just look like gods to me, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they had a certain aura. So it was at that time that I decided that I'm going to venture that way, you know? So that's when I came into the mosque around that time, 1990, 91. All praises due to Allah. Yes, sir. And how did your family and friends feel about you accepting the teachings? Well, my, my friends were always uh, supportive, you know? They knew that I was not uh, a fly-by-night type of brother, you know, that whatever I was involved in, I was 100%. Uh, my family, on the other hand, they thought that I was going through a phase. Mm -hmm. So my mom was like, yeah, she had seen me dibble and dabble around this, dibble and dabble around that. So this was probably just gonna be another phase and uh, this too will pass. But um, years went by and she was like, oh, you, oh, you really serious about this, huh? <laughs> I was like, yeah, what did you think? <laughs> you know, we talking about five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years later, we were having that conversation. But, you know, as, as my mom in particular saw the transformation in me, 
um, she she really started to listen to the teachings, you know, because I would I would feed her. I would tell her, Ma, listen, you need to listen to this and you need to listen to that. And then she started opening up about the nation. And I eventually I wanted to find out what was it that that what was the what what made uh, me inclined to the nation, whereas none of my other siblings gravitated towards the nation. Mm -hmm. so my, my mom expressed to me that back in uh, the late 60s, 69, uh, going into 70, 68, 69, going into 1970, she uh, she was a uh, not necessarily a dressmaker, but she dibbled dibble oh, dabbled so with uh, clothing. Mm. So she said she, her influence was the sisters in the nation back th at that time. They would all go to the garment, uh, garment district together and get fabric. So that kind of uh, influence or had some weight when she was pregnant with me, mm. because mm. when I when I came in nineteen, I, I came in nineteen seventy one, but she was pregnant in seventy with me. So that influence of being around the sisterhood at that time influenced possibly my uh my coming that way beautiful all praises due to a lot and thank you yes, for your yes. amazing testimony and thank everyone who's watching my sister miriam and naima send the greetings and i want to make sure i thank everyone Please who continues to like share and subscribe to the people's podcast can't wait to put this on youtube now speaking yes, of sir. dr college sir what was it like um being around him during that time period and i, I just saw i saw a clip on youtube where you were holding posts with uh, minister conrad and um, you all were uh, dealing with Malcolm X and all of that. What was it like during that time period? That that the early nineties was <laughs> the early nineties was um really hardcore for us. You know, it was not no it was not no plaything uh, with us back in the, in the nineties in the early nineties. And uh, at the time when I was coming into the nation, Khalid was here, uh, Minister Conrad was here. But there was a transition taking place where Khaled was gone out and Minister Conrad was being ushered in as the New York minister. Mm, mm. So, you know, that's the that's the period that I came in. Uh, but you know, we worked, man. We worked in the in the 90s, like we were hardcore. You know, we went out, if you remember, when we were selling the papers, uh, a bundle, a hundred papers was a minimum for the FOI. Mm. Mm -hmm. So we were selling two, three hundred, some seven hundred papers, and we were just getting recouping thirty cent on each paper. Today, you know, brothers that are selling the paper, they're getting a whole dollar, and we were selling much more back then, making less. But now we're making less, and people are selling more, less. <laughs> they're making more now, selling less. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. We were, we were just dedicated to what we said we, we believed in, man. We believed in, in the mission, and we had great representative, and those representatives that were before us represented the minister well to us, you know? So it made everything easier uh, in terms of motivation for us to work. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. Well, what was it like um, meeting for you, meeting the most honorable minister of Farrakhan for the first time? Man. That meeting, I'll never, I'll never forget the, the first day, <clears throat> the first day that I met the minister intimately, you know, and the reason for is us even being in the company of the minister was uh, my captain, who was the regional captain at the time, Captain Dennis Muhammad, uh, Captain Emeritus uh, now, but Captain Dennis, he was part of that escort team along with your father, Brother Shaheed, Brother Sadiq, uh, Brother Akil, uh, Captain Curtis. So uh, when I met the minister, Captain Dennis had put me in the hotel, in the suite. <clears throat> mm, mm, mm. And they left. He said, listen, nobody is to be letting into this suite until we get back. And when I knock on the door, you'll see us. So um, they left, went to the airport. I'm in the, I'm in the suite by myself. Uh, actually, myself and Sister Celestina, mm, mm. you know, myself and Sister Celestina was in the, the hotel suite and uh, Captain Dennison and the rest of the regional captains left to go to the airport. So when they got back, which was like an hour and a half later, uh, the knock on the door came. I looked through the peephole 
And all I remember seeing <laughs> at that time was fur coats. Mm, 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 so I saw Captain Dennis, I opened the door and uh, everybody came in and then I closed the door. But I don't remember ever seeing the minister. Mm. I just saw all the regional captains and uh, some of the E-team and that's all I remember. So they closed the door and I was inside and I'm looking around, I'm like, Damn, where, where's the minister at? I know the minister came in with this group. Where's the minister? So I'm looking, I'm looking, then I saw him. He had on this like white fur coat. Uh, and then he, I saw him on the other side of the suite. And then uh, next thing you know, he was he was right up on me. I don't know how he he was able to evade me, but I went from looking at him on the in the dining room area, and then next thing you know, he was right next to me at the front door. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, shoot. So he said, uh, he said, what is your name, brother? And I, I, I gave him my name. And uh, I was so nervous. I didn't know what to say, what to do. I just wanted to be cool and not lose my cool. And But in, in, inside, I was falling apart. I was like, I can't believe the, this is the minister. This is Minister Farrakhan. Brother, I couldn't wait to get out of that hotel suite <laughs> to let everybody know that I had met the minister and the minister shook my hand. And he, I remember he, when he uh, introduced himself, he uh, he had kind of pat me on my cheek. Man, I just wanted to get out that whole hotel room to let everybody know that I had actually seen and met the minister. Mm -hmm. So that was my, my first time. Praise be to Allah, yes, sir. And yes, sir. what was it like doing security uh, and putting your life on the line for him during those during that time period? Brother, it's it's like putting our life on the line today. I would do it without even even a thought. Mm -hmm. But I never looked at it as putting our life on the line because I grew to understand that the minister was secure. He was our security. So we were just escorting him from point A to point B. But if there was a if there was a a, a threat, we would step to that threat, even if we didn't make it back. That that was the sentiment. So it wasn't hard for me to do it, you know, uh, and I would do it today. But, you know, the, 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 I understand that the minister is the one that secures us. And I, I, I you know, even though I know that the minister is going to depart from us uh, physically to, to be with Don, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I know that uh, great strife is going to come to us when he's not amongst us. Mm. You know, so the only thing we have is uh, each other and uh, the true and living God, man. Praise be to Allah. Well, speaking of that, what advice, what, what advice do, would you give to people who um, who may be doubting and have, you know, be nervous about the minister leaving? What advice would you give to, you know, give to people to keep, you know, to keep a strong faith? You have to you have to get rooted on your own. You know, there's there's enough in the teachings for us to nurse on. There's enough from the minister's words that we can nurse on. And it's it's almost like, you know, knowing that 75, 1975 is going to revisit us. So what what caused the nation to fall back then? It was, I think, from my vantage point now, just studying the teaching, I think it was those who idolize and worship the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and 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 when they didn't see him anymore, they lost they lost faith. So we have to strengthen our faith by way of practicing these teachings, reading and understanding what we read, and just uh, our prayer life, man, and living a, a upright life as Muslims. That's the only protection, you know, for me. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. Well, I've interviewed a lot of uh, believers who talk about the time period in New York. Um, their, you know, amazing time periods in New York under different administrations. What was yes, it like sir. under um, Minister Benjamin or Reverend Benjamin Chavis? What was that like as, 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 when he was the minister of the mosque? Oh, man. You know, uh, I think under Minister Benjamin, we not only had Minister Benjamin, we had uh, a new captain as well. Mm. So, you know, if you, if, if, if you know that Minister Benjamin came, came from the church and the NWACP, 
So he was a new minister in terms of a, a, a Nation of Islam minister. It was a very, for me, it was a low time because, you know, we had to adapt to a certain style of teaching. And then we had a, a captain at the time, uh, Brother Aziz, who, when the minister spoke at Jacob Javits in, I believe, 1993, uh, I took him, I took him home to Brooklyn. So on our way back to Brooklyn, I talked to him about, you know, him, him being accused of murdering Malcolm and, uh, how he handled that. So I, I got a little personal with him. So when he, when he did, when he did start coming around regularly, it was, it was, it was kind of, kind of arrogant the way he was coming off, you know, he was telling us that, yo, listen, Farrakhan is, is, is your leader, but he's my brother. So it, it didn't really set well with me as it didn't set well with a lot of brothers. And it could have been just based on his style, uh, his, his suffering, how he had lost his family and, you know, what he thought he was going to get back by being a captain in the nation. You know, I don't know, but I know at that time when, uh, Captain Aziz and Minister Benjamin, it was a low point in the nation for me, you know. So, not to not, no indictment on them as a as a uh, as individuals, but for me that that period was a, a low point for me. You know, we I didn't do much during that time, but I remember the minister says uh, because people were complaining about the leadership. And uh, the minister said, well, you know, because people were hinting that, you know, hip hypocrites are taking over the mosque and blah, blah, blah. And people were kind of saying, like, you know, I left the nation because of this. So the minister, I mean, he's so wise and so brilliant. The minister says, I'm paraphrasing now. He says, if you are the believer and the hypocrites have taken over the mosque, what does that make you if you left the mosque to the hypocrites? And mm -hmm. I was like, damn. So it didn't, at that point, I said, there's no excuse why we shouldn't work to uphold the banner of Islam in New York. So whoever come or go, they may come and go, but we have to uphold the banner and keep running with this banner. Praise be to Allah. Beautiful. Yes, sir. And thank everybody who's watching. Um, when, speaking of that, so I'm watching the Godfather of Harlem as we speak. There was, you know, everything's always been about Malcolm X all over the country. I've experienced that in Chicago, especially in Atlanta, with a lot of people, but mainly it comes from New York. How were you all mm -hmm. able to, to handle the people who had a misunderstanding with the nation um, dealing with Malcolm X and then having to have the Betty Shabazz thing at the Apollo? How, how did you handle that? Well, there's so many, there's so many truth out here, man. There's documented truth from the Cointel Pro papers. Uh, as to uh, Malcolm's position around the time when uh, he got assassinated, um, the people who were involved, all those things are documented, you know, and we know and understand that there's no statute of limitation on murder. So for the people who, who uh, kind of ate up what was being talked about in the public, that the nation killed Malcolm or Minister Farrakhan has something to do with uh, the death of Malcolm, they know that that's not true because if that was true, the government would have been came in and tried to scoop up the minister. But there was so many facts as to the actual shooters, uh, brother Aziz being innocent, uh, another brother, the two brothers that were innocent that served 20 years in jail. Yes, sir. And the one that was actually a shooter, he wanted to testify, he wanted to come come forward and testify as to the other participants in the murder. That never even made it to court. He mm -hmm. was never able to discuss those names. So, you know, it's just talk. And it's like every 10 years, they recycle the Malcolm thing. So the people, are, a lot of people are hip to it. And the, the ones that try to keep pushing the Malcolm thing, they don't love Malcolm no way, because if they loved Malcolm, they'll be practicing these teachings or what Malcolm practiced. It's a lot beautiful. Yes, well, there's a lot of pictures, uh, well, especially YouTube, but there are pictures on Facebook as well and on the internet of Betty Shabazz meeting with the minister at the Apollo and Jada Pinkett and so many people being there. Um, yeah. I was too young to be a part of that event, but both of my parents were there. 
Uh, what was it like to, to, to have that historical event and have it in New York? It was a, a humbling event. That happened at the Apollo uh, in New York. And I remember that uh, when, they, when they actually walked in, Mother Khadijah and, and, and Sister Betty Shabazz were like hand in hand. And that hadn't been since, since her husband parted. Uh, husband was murdered. So to actually see that uh, that kind of relationship could have been brokered and was happening was uh, Allah just working his majesty, man, you know? So, uh, I mean, that was, a, that was a beautiful day. And I remember looking at Betty Shabazz, she just felt like she was back at home. You know, mm-hmm. just looking at her face and the facial features and her expressions and her and Mother Khadija laughing, you know, it was something to see, you know, knowing that these these two uh, wives had not spoken to each other in however number of years it had been. I don't have the actual facts on that, but to actually see them together and like, you know, hand in hand and smiling and joking with each other, it was it was a great show of uh, brotherhood and sisterhood. Praise be to Allah. Amazing, amazing. And I want to thank everyone who's continued. We have a few more questions for you, Brother Chris, as we, uh, I'm Brother Khalil, as we um, uh, deal with your history in New York. Uh, but I want to make sure that I also ask you about drill. So about two or three years ago, you came out with uh, the New York FOI, and, but you've been drilling since, you know, we, we were little children. Uh, yes, sir. Children. What, what, what is your love, where did you develop a love uh, for drill from? Uh, to be honest, man, uh, brother Captain Malik, mm. that was uh, that was the captain in L.A. Yes, sir. I, yes, saw, sir. I saw I saw a videotape of them drilling, and I was like, oh, I like that. Then uh, brother Captain Malik was one. Uh, brother Jason X, who was a New York second officer when I came into the mosque. Those two in particular, you know, but. Couple, uh, I think it was maybe three years ago. Yes, sir. You know, Brother Alton brought me out of retirement, and I was like, <laughs> you know, he had us uh, like the, the the seniors because some yes, of us still do, we still do drill. So yes, he's sir. like, yeah, I had this idea. We're gonna bring the 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 older brothers with the new the younger brothers, and I thought it was a phenomenal idea, man. But we got you know we got smashed. But you know, it was it was good to be back out there. Uh, drilling on that kind of center stage, you know? Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. And, and it was good um, to see you all come back and to see the unity. And inshallah, we will be able to see more of that in the future on and off stage of the brothers closing ranks of all the different age groups. Because that was a beautiful sight to see yes, sir. Uh, at the drill competition. Yes, sir. Okay, quick 60 second commercial break for all of the sponsors of the People's Podcast. I want to make sure that I thank everyone for this upcoming season. I thank... Uh, Brother Khalil again, and thank all of the sponsors of the People's Podcast before we come right back to our brother. If you would like to be a sponsor or donor of the People's Podcast, please cash at the People's Podcast. I'm going to start with my brother. Uh, here we go. I'm going to start with my brother Rashad and his um, company, Street Premier Media Production. Here we go, one second. And we come right back to Brother Khalil. And thank you, Sister Valley, for your shout out to LA. She said shout out to LA's in the house because, of course, Brother Malik. My brother Rashad, Street Premier Media Production. He has a 4K camera. And a drone, he does television and film editing. Thank you very much. Please reach out to him. My sister Miriam, ABC I Love Me, children's book and coloring book, both of which are available on Amazon. Please go out and get those books. My sister Naima, Stay On Point Dance Academy, LLC. She teaches ballet virtually to young girls all across the country. And right here in the studio in Atlanta, Georgia, we love our tiny dancers. Um, sister Rashida Rafat, Raw Communications. They offer copy, ed- she offers copy editing, project management, content development, media relations, and consulting. And she's having a five-year sale coming up and we'll post that later on today. Uh, conflict mediation with uh, student minister uh, Robert L. Muhammad out of Austin, Texas. Texas, Squash the Beef, he's in the community doing an amazing job. His wife, Sister Fudia Muhammad, children of the most high, uh, giving birth to a God in the science of child re- rearing. Please make sure you all get that. Uh, Fudia Muhammad, Sister Fudia Muhammad, Children of the Most High. We're coming right back to Brother Chris. Thank you for the love and for always showing love. Brother Kenneth, Bowtie Maker Extraordinaire. He'll show bow tie to you anywhere in the country. Thank you very much, Brother Kenneth. Dr. Henry M. Carter right here in Atlanta, Georgia, King Henry's Turkey Legs. Um, Brother Rashad Muhammad of, of 
Chicago COVID-19 Disinfecting Cleaning Services, my father's book, A Soldier in the Movement of Christ, abdusharif.com, and last but not least, my two books, Cleopatra and No Father, No Excuse, both of which are available on Amazon. Thank you all very much. As we come right back to our brother, uh, Khalil. Okay, so yes, sir. So brother Khalil, my next question is, in your time in New York, has there ever been a time, or throughout the nation, all your travels, men's only, and all of these things, where you've been faced with fear? And if so, how did you overcome that fear? I don't think uh, I ever really studied the fear that have come to us. Uh, one time in particular, you know, I don't know if you know, uh, but I've been hearing talks about the the mosque the mosque attack back in uh, the early nineties. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I think that's one of the only time that I was actually faced faced with something bigger than what I thought it was. But you know, it's like what the minister teaches, man. That if you fear is a natural occurrence, right? Yes, sir. But but we have to confront it that we may be able to overcome it and master it. Yes, sir. So that same that same situation or that circumstance taught me a lot about challenging your fears. You know, uh, when 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 the the, the, the mosque was uh, attacked, we just responded. We didn't, we didn't consider what we were running into. We didn't consider that, you know, we might be shot down, you know, like others have in, in LA and, and different places where Muslims were shot and killed. We just responded, you know? So that's an example for me in terms of dealing with fear. And we were, we were, we were uh, victorious. Praise be to Allah. Can you please let us know what happened uh, that day? Well, that day, uh, I mean, it was a it was a cold day in January, and it had snowed. Uh, I think a couple of days before, so you know that particular Sunday, it was like really, really cold, icy, you know. Uh, and then I just heard uh, a rumbling. I thought this rumbling that was taking place was in the check post. So me and another brother, we ran down a, the hallway to the check post and it was nothing. And then when we ran in the hallway, it was actually at the bottom of the steps. So we had two high, two high steps uh, leading up to the third floor. So when we looked down, all we saw was like a mob of people down at the bottom of the, the stairwell. And we just flew down there, man. When we got down to the bottom, we saw that it was police officers trying to enter the mosque uh, with their guns, of course. So, you know, we just responded to it. Uh, but now that, I, you know, after the fact, I I'd, I'd realized that there was a protocol in place for any law enforcement that came to our mosque. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, 20 years prior, it was a similar incident where a police officer actually lost, lost his life. <clears throat> but... So since uh, 1972, there was a protocol in place that if there was any police to enter our mosque, they had to be uh, escorted by a, a white shirt, which is a captain, and one of our officials. That didn't happen. They were saying that, you know, there was a robbery in progress in the mosque. We were like, a robbery in progress? Ain't no robbery in progress in our mosque. We're having a mosque meeting. And if there's a robbery in progress in the mosque, we're going to handle that. You know, mm, mm, but mm. they uh they were persistent in trying to enter with their guns. They were trying to draw their guns, and it didn't happen. You know, oh, so wow. they had uh they had kind of um what do you call it subdued the mosque on the on the exterior. They weren't allowing anybody to come in. They weren't allowing anybody to come out. And um, later on that evening, because we were there from from two o'clock to seven o'clock. I'm talking about guests and everything. Mm -hmm. They weren't allowing, they weren't allowing nobody to come in. So they were saying that, listen, there's a there's a radio that was taken and a pistol, uh, a police officer's gun that was taken. And then, you know, our officials got with some of their officials and they agreed that, listen, they weren't gonna, they weren't gonna arrest anybody on site, but what they would do is if they were able to identify any of the brothers that 
later on, we would bring them down to the precinct. And um, that was the, the end of that. Mm. So, you know, there was uh, one brother that actually uh, identified, mistakenly identified, and uh, he was on trial and actually was going to court for that, that incident. But he, he ended up uh, be, being acquitted. Wonderful. Yes, sir. Okay, so when they're they're outside or they're trying to come in and this is this does it, does it ever get physical or is it just like a standoff? Oh no, it was physical, man. I, okay. I wasn't getting into any details, but yeah, <laughs> I'm saying it's uh, like this attack on the minds, but then he's like it's kind of like they're negotiating. I'm like, what's going on right now? <laughs> no, there was there was no there was no 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 negotiation, man. It was uh it was an all out brawl. Mm, mm. It was an all out brawl, man, on the sidewalk. It started from the door. They were trying to, because when we got downstairs, it was two officers. And no more than 30 seconds later, there was 30, 40, 50 officers. Mm, mm, mm. So we were trying to figure out how is that possible? Like, what happened? Where did, where did the breakdown in communication come? So they were still trying to get in because they were saying, uh, their officers got punched in the face and uh, the guns were taken and their radios were taken. So they were determined that, yo, listen, we the New York City Police Department. We going up in this mosque. And we were like, we the fruit of Islam. You ain't coming up in this mosque. <laughs> and that was our attitude. So uh, we had brothers that held the front and the rest of us went to work uh, on the sidewalk, man, until mm. it actually, uh, the standoff came where... Um, they wanted to get the gun back. So, you know, they had to call Cap Dennis. Cap Dennis was, I think, in Florida on vacation at the time. So our uh, our brass uh, worked it out with their brass that, you know, they would allow everybody to come out, women first, women and children, and then uh, then the men. And that, that took about five hours mm. before guests could leave the mosque. Mm, mm. So that was nightfall. So when that happened, man, they just, you know, they were able to identify one brother, allegedly. Not not on the scene. They uh mm. took every they took every license plate from every car that was a four block radius of the mosque. And then they went to visit each uh each car owner. And when they came across one one individual that looked like what they said was a suspect. Then they arrest they arrested they arrested him. <clears throat> Excuse me. They arrested that brother. Mm. Yeah, but it was it was an all out brawl, brother. But the blessing the blessing was that, you know, given given the history where that uh, officer was was killed, and mind you, the officer was killed by his own pistol. Mm. Um, or one of his uh his 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 other police officer's pistol, mm, mm. That, that no life was lost, you know, bloody nose, maybe a broken this, maybe, but uh, bruised ego, maybe, but no life was lost. So police, uh, I mean, uh, Commission Commissioner Bratton, who was the police commissioner in, in Boston under Minister Don, they had a, a, a great relationship in police officer, I mean, uh, Commissioner Bratton, he wrote a book. And in his book, he start off his book with that story of him when he was the when he came to New York as the police commissioner and that mm. incident in the mines. Mm, mm. That was like his first day on the job. <laughs> <laughs> to deal with that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, a, what a first day. Yes, sir. And, you, yes, sir. and after that, did the did the relationship with the FOI and the police become better? Well, you know, uh, it did, you know, we, we always had a relationship with the police department because Captain mm -hmm. Dennis, again, I got to big up my, my, my big brother, my big brother, Captain. He established a lot of great relationships with the police officers and the police department doing sensitivity training. Mm -hmm. So he would go into all the Harlem precincts and speak to the, the police officers about how they should conduct themselves dealing with our people, you know, the respect level. And he not only dealt with the police officer, he also dealt with our people in the street on how they should respond to law enforcement because it's a twofold situation. 
if somebody pull you over, if a, a police officer pull you over, I'm not going to be all irate. Man, what you pulling me over for? You know, it's all about mm -hmm. language, tone, because you can get across your point uh, in, a, in a civilized manner. And unfortunately, a lot of our people don't know that, man. They're very emotional. And you see all the clips that come on social media with our people getting uh, their behind toe up. It's sometimes it could be circumvented by, by their tone, you know, and how they handle the situation. So the, we had a great relationship with the police department, man, um, especially in Harlem. You know, the minister was always traveling to New York back then in the 90s. So mm -hmm. we, we always had police escort. Uh, I mean, it didn't affect it didn't affect our relationship with the police officers at all. Excellent. Praise be to a lot. OK, well, yes, um, leading up men's only leading up to the Million Man March, what was the climate like? in New York City, and how did the Million Man March personally impact you? Uh, uh, okay, well, the, the million, the, the all, okay. The minister spoke at the Jacob Javits, right? Yes, sir. And he said to the uh, the people that came out, uh, especially the men, because a lot of, this was on the heels of Stop the Killing Tour. So, you know, black men were just doing, just doing all kinds of stuff to each other, man, with the killing. So the minister wanted to address men in particular. He said, would we allow him to come back and speak to all men? And everybody was like, you know, there was overwhelming applause about him coming back. He came back and spoke at the 369th Armory to all men's. And when I saw black men lining up, filling that armory, then the line, I mean, the, the armory was filled and the line was going down the block, around the corner, up Lenox Avenue, onto the 145th Street Bridge, into the Bronx. That's where the lines went. This is all men. And from there, we started the, the, uh, the, men's, the men's march, right? The men's only meeting. And I was with the minister from when he came back in the country in Toronto and every city in between that all the way to Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And then leading up to the Million Man March, I remember that morning I came out on the lawn and uh, I looked on the lawn and I was like, man, this, this is a big place to cover. But when I looked out, it was just like maybe six, seven, maybe a hundred, uh, a thousand people out there. When I came back out there, maybe around 10-ish, I couldn't believe that this was the same place that I looked at that morning. Mm, mm, mm. Because all I saw was people as far as I could see. And I remember Captain Dennis, he was like, he wanted to see how far this, this, this crowd went. So we walked. We walked from the front all the way to the back. And man, it was just like, Black men all over the place. Black men, black men, black men. Everybody's like, hey, bro. I mean, it was just like heaven on earth that day. So that's the main man march impacted my life so much, man, that, you know, it really made me uh, want to do more in terms of educating our people, you know. But of course, we went to work and the enemy went to work also. Yes, sir. You know? yes, sir. So he went to work with his social media and social engineering. That's why it's very important. These kind of outlets that you have with the podcast is very important so people can see uh, what we're about from another vantage point uh, because everybody used to think that the FOI is only about Final Call and Bean Pie. <laughs> yeah. And still today. Yes, a sir, lot of absolutely. people think that. They're like, yo, how much money you make off of the bean pies or, or the final call? And I'm like, no, this not, is this not what this is about. You know, this brother over here is a contractor. I'm a contractor. This brother yes, over here is a doctor. My other partner right here is a fire chief. Yes, you know, yes, this, is a, this is a police officer. This is an engineer. So they're like, oh, that's, oh, y'all don't just sell final call and bean pie? Exactly. Like, no, this is to propagate our faith, you know? And so just read, read one article. And after you read one article, then read another article. And, and don't ever throw the paper out. Leave it in a barbershop or leave it somewhere in a bus station. 
or leave yeah. it on your living room table so somebody else can read it. So, you know, man, uh, the Mean Man March just impacted me uh, to the day. You know, when I look back at it, when I see footage, I'm like, we were part of that history. We were intimately, intimate part of that history, the Million Man March. So praise be to Allah. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. What has been your um, greatest trial in life and how have you overcome that trial? Greatest trial and how do I overcome that trial? Greatest trial and how do I overcome that trial? Uh, well, I think one of the tri one of the major trials that I got hit with, <clears throat> where it, it really kind of took me back, and based up based on the support from the uh, the brotherhood and sisterhood, it really helped me. Um, was when I I came to New York after I left Atlanta, and I think a year after I I had gotten here from uh, leaving Atlanta, I got hit by Hurricane Sandy. And um, Hurricane Sandy took everything. Every, any and every worldly possession that I had was gone. I'm talking about gone. Uh, pictures of my children, uh, places I've been uh, when I was working as a government contractor overseas, uh, footage of, of, of different countries I've been to, you know, just everything. Shoes, clothes, you know, certificates, books, you know, laptop, you know, personal items, but um, all that was gone. So I, I didn't have one, my my uh, living situation changed where I had, I had to figure out where was I gonna live because I didn't have any job at the point because Sandy just wiped out the whole city. <clears throat> so no one was working. Then not having a place that I can call my, my own, you know, and it was uh, the brotherhood that opened up their doors to me, man. Um, and one brother, may Allah be pleased with me, he's no longer here, brother brother Leif. Uh, he put me up for a whole year. Praise be to Allah. You know, until I got back on my feet and then I, you know, moved out and went on my own. But that was my one of my biggest trials. <clears throat> you know, praise be to Allah. Shout out to the brotherhood. Shout out to your perseverance. Yes, what, what has been your greatest joy in life? Greatest joy, oh man, my children. That's what you know. I think <laughs> that's uh, one of the, one of the reasons why I sent you those pictures because that is my absolute uh, legacy. You know, my children to affect my children to where they see the value of the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm, mm. You know, because I grew up uh, in the streets and affected by the streets, where my children they don't know nothing about the streets, absolutely nothing. Uh, and that is a, a great accomplishment uh, for me and my family, knowing that we were able to do uh, the bare minimum to uh, circumvent them from falling falling in the traps of the uh, of the life of the streets. So all of them are very successful. Uh, they have never they have never given me no kind of problems. None of my children, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, that's my that's my greatest joy. You know. Yes, sir. Well, being from New York and um, being someone who um, has always been in the fashion and dressing well, what, 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 why do you have such a passion for like for fashion? What is it what you would dress code? I think if a person look, uh, if a person look good, they feel good. Okay, okay, okay. I mean, that's just that's just the bottom line, you know. Some people have a a, a little better knack at it, you know, like they're fashion fashion savvy. Uh, like my brother, my brother Don, you know. Uh, my brother Jacques, who's here, you know, it's a few other brother, brother Sean, who's down there in Atlanta. Um, but there's countless brothers, man. But our greatest example is the minister. When you look at the minister, you don't never see him run over shoes. You yeah. know, so he's, he's our example. He's always, you don't see him with, with a scully on in the winter, you know, <laughs> with a suit. So he's, he's our standard. So I just had a, a passion for fashion. Uh, but along with that, when you, when I when I look a certain way, I feel a certain way, mm. you know. And it's 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 bait. It doesn't make me or make us, but it's uh it's bait for somebody else to say, oh man, you look good, and oh you look nice, and oh, where'd you get that? And then you could you could draw up a conversation from that 
to impart, uh, you know, the teaching of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You know, so it's just a, it's a, it's a, a, a doorway to lead to something else. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. Thank you. And Brother Derek 3X is showing you love. Sister Khadija Kareem wants to know, how how did you raise those babies to give you no problem? She needs help, LOL. Like, how did you do that? That belt. <laughs> <laughs> that belt. You know, listen, if you don't, and, and look, I would do I would do things differently today. You know, not, not I'm not an advocate for using the belt on my children, but I did. Um, but as I grew, I, I used less belt and more conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have to you have to talk to your children <coughs> where they understand that you mean you you mean business. If your children see you as a plaything, you ain't got you ain't got a chance with with, with children. They'll run right over you. And you can't you can't spoil them. You can't spoil your children with things. You got to give them life lessons because you know the, the 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 world is a real place, and it don't care nothing about how they how your children look or uh, whose children they are. It'll chew them up and spit them out. So you have to give them life lessons, you know. And that's what I started to do. Like when my children were like preteens, I never had to. Put my hands on them anymore not that i wouldn't but i hadn't had to because the early years they knew that yo, know, my dad is not gonna play my dad don't play my mom i could get over on but my mom, my dad he's not playing with that so you just got to be firm and your children have to know that there's love there your children don't feel no love forget it they'll they'll cuss they'll, they'll cuss you later on in life mm -hmm. you know and i've seen i've seen many children where they hate their parents. And you gotta you gotta be balanced with your children also, man. Um you gotta you gotta give them some leeway here. You know, you gotta give them some discipline here, you gotta give some love here, you gotta give them some affection over here. You just gotta be a balanced parent. It can't be all, oh, we're going to the mosque. Okay, that's cool. But do you ever take them to a theme park? <laughs> you ever go out in, in the park and play with them? You know, do they go to the movies? Do they just go out, let's get in the car and go get some ice cream? You know, and it's, and it's a little thing. You don't have to do things major with your children, but my children, all of my children, by God's permission, man, with my uh, my ex-wife, uh, we vacation a lot with our children, a lot. My children have been to a lot of different countries, cruises, you know, they still traveling. So you just gotta be a balanced parent. Beautiful. Praise that, that was for Sister Khadija. Yes, sir. Okay, may Allah bless you, Sister Khadija. Yes, sir. Praise be to Allah. Thank everyone for continuing to watch the People's Podcast. I can't wait to put this on YouTube. My next yes, question man. for you, sir, is what type of music do you like to listen to? Man, I like it all. Mm. I like mm. it all. I like all kinds of music, and music is the 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 one thing that I can't do without. Okay, okay. I could I could do without a lot of things, but music I can't do without. I gotta have some. <laughs> I gotta have some reggae, I gotta have some R&B, I gotta have some slow jam, some classical, some rumba, some salsa, whatever it is, as long as it's good listening, I'm with it. Right, one one type of music I, I can't take, heavy metal. Okay, 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 you can't take that's, heavy that's metal? It. That's it. Okay, yes sir. And she says, thank you, and may Allah continue to bless you. Okay, we just have three that's more that. questions for you, Brother Chris, and thank everyone who seems to watch the People's Podcast. My next question for you is, if you could meet God face to face and mm. ask him any question, what would you ask him? If I could meet God face to face. Whew, that's a loaded question, Big Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Oh, man. I would I would I would really want to know. Like, what is, you know, because life and death, right? I understand that we've been here for trillions of years. Yes, sir. Right? You and I are only here for a moment. Then we gone forever, right? Yes, sir. I would like to know what would that other extension of our life look like? You know? Because... That's that's the that's the question I would I would love to know. 
That's what right. I was asking. Great, great uh, question, sir. You're the second person that answered that and to say that you would ask that question. I think that mm -hmm. a lot of us would like to know that. So I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only yes, one. Sir. Praise be to Allah. Okay, two more questions. My next question is, what do you think that God would ask you if he would ask you one question face to face? Mm. What would God ask me? Man, I'm clueless. I'm clueless on that one. Mm. Because he already know, he already know <laughs> what he already know about me. You yes, know? sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know what he would ask me. Okay, great. My sister Miriam says that's a great question uh, that you would ask. My my okay, our last question is uh for you, Brother Khalil. What what would you like your legacy to be? Oh, uh, what would I like my legacy to be? I would like my legacy to be, again, for my children to know that their father uh, sacrificed his life, that they may have life mm, mm. and enjoy enjoy the, the, the fruits of my labor, you know, because I have sacrificed much for them. And sometimes, you know, they may think that, oh, damn, I wish I had my dad here and here and there and, you know, being away from the family. But it was all done for, for them, you know. So I'd like my legacy to be my children. Beautiful, great response, sir, and a great legacy. Well, I want to thank everyone for continue who who watched, and I want to thank you, brother. Clue. I learned so much about you. I definitely didn't know most of that stuff, but definitely didn't know about Jamaica and any of that. So that's great <laughs> as well. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the People's Podcast. I want to thank you on behalf of myself, my family, and the viewing audience for your sacrifice and the sacrifice of your family, sir, because we truly appreciate it and we are uh, very humbled. Every time I see you, I tilt my hat and salute you for the work that you all did and continue to do with being a uh, shining examples of, FO, of what an FOI is. So we thank you for that, sir. I mean, I thank you, Brother Joshua. And please, please give your father the greens and your, your siblings and uh, Brother Rashad. Brother Rashad, I always think about him. <clears throat> um, and the rest of the believers there in Atlanta, man. Tell them I yes, miss sir. them. That's that's like my second home. Uh, and everybody keep asking me, when you going back to Atlanta? When you going? I say, I'm coming. I'm coming back. <laughs> I just don't know when, but I'm coming. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But May thank Allah you. bless you and keep you, brother. Yes, sir. Thank you as well. This is Joshua Leonard Muhammad signing off of the People's Podcast. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Well, alaikum. Thank you again, beloved. Thank you.